So it is our pleasure to introduce Dr. Eddie Ramirez. A little bit about him. Dr. Ramirez, he is a medical doctor, a research scientist, a published author, an international speaker, and he's currently the director of Adventist Whole Health in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. And as a world traveler, Dr. Ramirez has spoken in 86 countries. How many countries have you been to? He has spoken in 86 countries. And he has been fe featured on multiple TV shows. As an avid researcher, he has more than 140 published scientific studies documenting the effects of lifestyle changes on different pathologies. He is a native of Mexico, but right now he lives with his wife and two daughters out in near Reading, Pennsylvania. And a few regards before I give the mic for Dr. Eddie Ramirez. We just please ask you to silence your cell phone so that it doesn't disturb other people or ring during the presentation. And also, if you do not get a copy of the free book called uh, Pandemic Busters, you can get that in the front desk. But I'm sure most of you already did. And with that note, I welcome Dr. Ramirez. Well, hello and welcome. <laughs> um, today we have one of the most important topics that you can ever learn about how to keep your uh, health. Before I started, I wanted to share this. This is my family. This is my, my wife and my three daughters. And um, a few couple of years ago, I had many invitations to speak in many places. So what I did, I took those invitations and put them together. And we went, our whole family, to 20 countries in one summer. So it was a very good experience to see, you know, different cultures and try different foods and, uh, you know, experience different ways of thinking and, and so forth. We had a, a good time together as a family as we went and, uh, you know, help people in many places improve their lives. But while we were gone, um, a bear came and did a hole in our house. <laughs> and help himself to some healthy food. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when a bear does that, it becomes dangerous. Because anytime he sees, he sees a house, what does he think about? <laughs> food, you know, so he's gonna start breaking in other houses. So my neighbor, you know, because we were gone, uh, uh, called the, the person that traps the bears, and they went ahead and trapped this bear. And then uh, there was an old washing machine. We were about to discard that washing machine. So what they did, they moved that washing machine and put it there in front of the hole while we, you know, uh, came back. And a second bear came, <laughs> moved the washing machine and finished what the other one didn't finish, you know. <laughs> They're pretty smart, you know. They even opened the fridge and, and, and took out the things out. And yeah, they left that pantry nice and clean, you know, by the time that we got here. <laughs> so a little contact info here. Uh, you can find my research there on that ResearchGate page. Just Francisco Ramirez ResearchGate. There is a Twitter account, quite active, Eddie RDMD. And so does the YouTube and the Instagram page. So if you were to ask me, doctor, I want to have a healthy life. I want to keep, you know, healthy. What do I need to know to be healthy? I will tell you one of the things you need to understand is the concept of inflammation. Because most diseases are going to come from inflammation. In fact, the reason why, you know, the joints start to get achy and, 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 and so forth, inflammation. The reason why people end up with dementia, inflammation. The reason why the person is going to end up in the ER with a stroke or a heart attack is inflammation. So if you're able to understand that concept, and start making some positive changes, 
you're going to avoid many of these health problems. And what happens is that there is a geographical pattern of disease in the world. In other words, there are places in the world where you find a lot of disease. There's places in the world where the rate of disease is much less. For example, regarding cancer worldwide, where do you see that there's a lot of cancer? Sadly, you're standing in there. Okay? This is uh, a, a huge you know, place where we find all kinds of cancers. And as you're going to learn today, the origin of that, it's not bad luck, is inflammation. So we need to identify sources of inflammation and make the right changes. Same pattern you find regarding diabetes, regarding obesity. It is a geographical pattern. In fact, when I'm saying there is a huge difference, you can see this in numbers. Check the cancer rates of prostate between America and Bangladesh. Is it just a little bit difference? It is humongous, the difference. And I'm telling you the reason why is inflammation. Notice this fascinating study. So you have a study about breast cancer. This is Journal Nature, one of the top journals in the world. And what they did, they started tracing the generations that, of immigrants from Japan. So in the very first line on the left, the higher the number, you know, the more the cancer. So on the very left is when the first people emigrated from Japan to America. Notice their cancer rates very small. Then to the right is the daughters of that one. What happened? They more than doubled the amount of breast cancer. And then the next one is the daughters of those second generation. And then the daughters of the daughters of the daughters is that fourth one. Can you see where this is going? See, as they acquire the way of living here in America, they got themselves in trouble. So we need to understand that this happened because of inflammation. That's the reason why. They acquire an inflammatory way of living. And I'm telling you, inflammation is devastating our communities. And lives are being shortened as a result of inflammation. Not only lives are shortened, but quality of life. When inflammation is present, what's happening is that the joints start to degenerate, the memory starts to go bad, the levels of energy go down, and the quality of life is not the best. So what's that inflammation that we're talking about? Okay, let me explain to you this by the following analogy. See, I want you to remember the last time you poked yourself with a needle. Anybody here has done that? <laughs> All of us, isn't it? Now, I want you to remember that experience. When you poke yourself with a needle, how did it feel? Man, it was such pleasurable sensation, isn't it? It felt so good, isn't it? <laughs> Is that what happened? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> it hurt, pain, first symptom of inflammation. The reason why you have pain is because you are programmed so that you pull your hand, you know, and you stop the damage from continuing and injuring yourself even further. What else happened? Did it have any change in the size of the finger that you poke? Swelling, second symptom of inflammation. Any change in the color? Redness, third symptom of inflammation. And what about temperature? Any change in the temperature? It got warmed. That's the fourth symptom of inflammation. The reason why you're having that four symptoms of inflammation is a way that the body runs an alarm 
and it tells the body something is not right. I need help. So the immune cells come in there. The cells that are in charge of reconstructing the tissues come there and start that process of healing. In fact, if you didn't have that inflammation, did you know you could literally die after poking yourself with a needle? Because the immune system wouldn't show up, the bacteria or whatever pathogens come there would multiply, and you would end up literally dying of a simple poking yourself with the needle. Now, the reason why inflammation started in the finger after you poked yourself with a needle is because any time you injure your cells, what you do, you break cells, and inside the cells is the most complicated word of this afternoon. There's something called arachidonic acid. So when the cell breaks, arachidonic acid is released, and that starts a cascade of inflammation. You know, there's uh, documents that survive from the first century after Christ. And there's this uh, physician back then, and he documented those four cardinal symptoms of inflammation by the word of Latin, calor, which means heat, dolor, which means pain, rubor, which means redness, and tumor, which means swelling. So even back then, this physician observed that this was a sign of inflammation. So anytime you injure your tissue, be it burn it, be it twist it, be it poke it, anything that damages the cells of your body will start that process of inflammation. Now, there are two types of inflammation. For example, when you poke yourself with a needle, how many months it took to heal? No, isn't it? It took a, a, actually a couple of hours or one or two days if it was like a little bit more, more severe. Things get repaired, body shuts down inflammation. That is what is called acute inflammation or short-term inflammation. The problem occurs when inflammation becomes chronic long-term. And a physician from Germany, Dr. Virchow, he started observing that the majority of the diseases that he was seeing, the origin, it was long-term inflammation. From arthritis, to dementia, to heart disease, to strokes, the origin of that was a long-term process of inflammation that end up triggering those diseases. So do you think it's important for us to learn about inflammation? <laughs> it is very important if we want to avoid being one of those statistics. In fact, if we check here in America, what are the leading causes of disease? You can see, number one, what is it? Heart disease, inflammation. Second, cancer, inflammation. Chronic lower respiratory diseases, inflammation. Accidents, that's an exception. That's not inflammation. It causes inflammation, you know, after you <laughs> hit yourself and so forth, but that's not the cause of the accident. Stroke, inflammation. Alzheimer's disease, inflammation. Diabetes, inflammation. Flu and pneumonia, inflammation. Kidney disease, inflammation. And even suicide is involved in inflammation because inflammation can trigger depression. So do you see the importance of this? As we expose ourselves to things that create chronic inflammation, our risk for disease increases. In fact, there is a geographical pattern here in America 
about inflammation. Here is a, a, a graphic for heart disease, but we learned that heart disease is caused by what? By inflammation, which means that if you live in those areas in America, you're at higher risk for inflammation. Let's zoom a little bit more. Here's Pennsylvania. See, there's some areas that are, uh, you know, that bright red, which means high risk. So, have you ever seen that we as doctors use a lot the word itis? <laughs> oh, you have colitis. Oh, you have pneumonitis. Itis means inflammation. And see, if you don't solve that itis, that can start transforming the cells into something nasty. So don't wait until you are all the way down there to start making the changes. Stop that inflammation from destroying your body early. In fact, the famous COVID-19, guess, guess what caused what this virus caused in the body? Inflammation. In fact, we could predict who was going to end up in the ICU, in the hospital, if the person already had chronic inflammation and then the virus came, which also causes inflammation, inflammation plus inflammation, what's the equal? <laughs> Even more inflammation. And that's the person that would end up with severe disease, you know. So we needed to tackle inflammation in order to decrease the risk for severe disease for COVID-19. And here is a very good book. I have this book at home. Notice the title. Inflammation, it's caused by the way we live, by our lifestyle, and that's what causes chronic disease. But here is the most important point. It is what type of link? <laughs> it's a silent link, and that's the biggest problem. See, if you fall and you break a bone, I don't know how courageous you think you are. I'm going to see you at the ER uh, sooner or later. You're going to come there and you're going to say, Doctor, this hurts so bad, I need help. Do something about it. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> but the problem with chronic inflammation is that it is silent. Many people can have that chronic inflammation and they don't realize it. Therefore, they think that everything is okay but they don't realize that that chronic inflammation sooner or later is going to cause a disaster in their, in their bodies. So in this uh, journal, they make the analogy between inflammation and fire. Is it a good idea to play with fire? <laughs> no, isn't it? You're going to end up burning yourself sooner or later. Do not play with fire. In fact, notice how Time Magazine calls inflammation. The what type of killer? <laughs> the sacred killer. I've seen this many times. There's a subgroup of patients. I'm going to see, I'm going to do a complete, you know, uh, history to understand what are their habits and so forth. We do blood tests to see what's going on inside. And I can see that person has chronic inflammation. And I'm going to talk to them, but there's a subgroup of patients that are going to say, Doctor, changes? I don't need to make any changes. I I'm fine. <laughs> but what, are, don't, what, what is it that they don't realize? The secret killer is devastating their life, and they don't realize it, other than being a little bit more tired than usual, having a little bit lower levels of energy, but you think that everything is okay, and it's not okay, because the fires inside of you are going to end up devastating your life. This is an excellent analogy. You know, here in Pennsylvania, having a fireplace is something very nice. You know? <laughs> Keeps the room, you know, nice and livable and, and cozy and, and, and so forth. 
But what happens if we go against the design? See, the fireplace is designed for the fire to be inside the fireplace. But what happens if I start putting wood and wood and wood and the wood starts to pile outside of the fireplace? Sooner or later, the fire is going to start creeping outside of there. And what's going to be the result? <laughs> Disaster is going to be the result. So that's why we need to be very careful not to put too much firewood on the fireplace. <laughs> or we're going to get ourselves in really big trouble. So what causes that chronic inflammation? Here are some things that trigger chronic inflammation. Cigarette smoking, very inflammatory. Uh, I have a, my brother-in-law, which happens to be even younger than, than myself. A uh, few months ago, he ended up with a massive heart attack. Smoker since, you know, a teenager. Sooner or later, that chronic inflammation catch up, and he ended up developing that heart disease. Alcohol, any form of alcohol is tremendously inflammatory, and you need to be watching out for that. I'll show you a study in a minute about that. Excess sunlight. Sunlight is great, but too much sunlight is not good. How do you know you got too much sunlight? Did it get red? <laughs> Did it get swollen? <laughs> Was it painful? <laughs> Watch out, especially if you are the type of worker that needs to be outside and so forth. You have to protect yourself, you know, not to burn yourself because you can create chronic inflammation. Also, any form of animal food that you eat. Why is that? Well, for example, a piece of chicken. When you eat a piece of chicken, what are you eating? You're eating cells from that chicken, yes or no? What's inside those cells? Happens to be arachidonic acid. So you don't necessarily need to burn, twist your ankle as you're eating that arachidonic acid you are turning on inflammation in the body without necessarily injuring your own body. Can you see the issue here? And also, excess body weight will trigger inflammation. I'll tell you more about it in a minute. So you can make an experiment, you know. Next time you go to Petco, get yourselves a, a few rats, and then uh, choose your favorite alcoholic beverage, you know, let's say beer, and with a paintbrush, you paint that beer on the skin of the rat. And in a few months, you're going to end up with a cancerous tumor. And now you know why. The answer starts with an I. Why? <laughs> because you cause inflammation that became chronic and you end up changing the cells of the skin, and you end up with a cancerous tumor. That's the way that this is triggered. So watch out for cannabis, marijuana. It's also very inflammatory. And this is something that has been documented very, very well. So, Notice this interesting study. It was trying to see what are the major triggers for cancer, which are also, you know, um, inflammation. So notice how tobacco is a quite an important factor regarding cancer, you know, triggering. But notice what else is even more important. What's the number two there? That means that in my home, I have something very dangerous. It's called a fork. <laughs> what you're poking with that fork <laughs> is either triggering quite a bit of inflammation or 
as we're going to learn today, if your choices are different, it may actually be stopping inflammation. And then you see the factor there of obesity. We talked about that uh, a little bit about it, the infections, and then other factors in a lesser extent. So notice a few of the factors for chronic inflammation. You have bacteria and viruses. You have environmental pollutants. You have the food choices you're taking. But notice also stress. Stress will also can trigger chronic inflammation. You need to be able to learn to deal with your stress in a healthy way. Because if your coping mechanism is not the best, you may be bringing chronic inflammation into your body. This is my study. You find it there on that research gate page that I told you. And uh, we had a very nice big uh, uh, sample. We had 6,795 people in this study. So what we did we started uh, doing uh, uh, questionnaires on this uh, big sample of people. This is from people from all over the world. There's uh, four continents represented in that survey uh, study. And um, we were asking them, what are you doing to deal with your stress? And we started correlating that to their levels of anxiety. Notice the fascinating results that we found in this huge sample that we run this study. We found that prayer and Bible study is one of the best ways of dealing with stress. Isn't that fascinating? Well, you know, Eastern meditation is almost equivalent to non, you know, no mechanism of dealing with your stress. So, as you can see, it is important to deal with our stress in a healthy way. Notice this uh, interesting study, how the cells in the people that have excess body weight are in what type of state, it says there? In a pro-inflammatory state. Now, that's the bad news. Here's the good news. If you are somebody that has excess body weight, the good news is, as soon as you start losing half a pound of a or a pound, that's enough to start lowering tremendously the markers of inflammation. So, if it's, you are in this group, use this as a motivation to start making the right changes so that you can lose that excess body weight and you can bring down the levels of chronic inflammation. In fact, the belly uh, fat, the one that is here inside the internal organs, that's a really, really bad fat. That's the one that is going to trigger the chronic inflammation. That's the one that is going to trigger the metabolic syndrome, the diabetes, the hypertension, and so forth. And there's a genetic variability. There are certain ethnicities that they don't need tremendous amounts of weight to trigger disease in them. Hispanics happen to be one of them. African Americans happen to be another one. Uh, Southeast Asians happen to be another one. These ethnicities, just a little bit of excess weight starts triggering all kinds of metabolic problems due to our genetic background. So we need to be extra careful because what other ethnicities may be able to handle a little bit more excess body weight for us, it is a huge deal. So we need to be more careful regarding our body weight. And this is something that has been documented very clearly. How excess body weight is linked to all kinds of different cancers. And now you know why. The answer starts with an I. Why? <laughs> because of inflammation. So that's the reason why it puts you at risk for many diseases that chronic inflammation can potentially cause. So here's a nice summary of things that trigger chronic inflammation. So you have 
alcoholic virtues, we talked about it, very inflammatory. Ultra excess body, ultraviolet radiation, very inflammatory. Stress, we talked about that. Cigarette smoking, I'll show you a study in a minute. Viruses are many of them inflammatory. The reason of the cervical uterine cancer and the cancer of the male member happened to be a virus by the name of the human papilloma virus. Now, how do you get this virus? Do you get it by bad luck? Not necessarily. Two or more sexual partners starts to increase exponentially your risk of catching this virus. Sadly, studies uh, are showing that 75% of students in public schools have the papillomavirus. So we're going to see very much increase of these types of cancers in the future. And there's a vaccine for that today, but there's more than 100 different types of papillomaviruses. That vaccine is just for six of them. So we may see a decrease of the six, but we're going to see an increase of the other ones in the future. Bacteria also can be inflammatory. The way you cook food, I'll, take, I'll show you an interesting study in a minute, and also pollution can be inflammatory. So as you can see, as we become aware of these things, I can start making changes to start decreasing the risk of chronic inflammation. A few more things that are inflammatory. Sleep. People that don't sleep enough, that triggers chronic inflammation. Watch out, you need to prioritize your sleep. I know the movie is interesting. I know the internet you know, is calling you for you to continue using it. You need to stop it, you know, <laughs> to go to bed. You need to prioritize your sleep because if not, you trigger inflammation. Sugar sweetened sodas, very inflammatory. Watch out, you know. Business people like to sell you these things, but they're not the best things if you want to avoid inflammation. Um, sitting too much. We need to learn to be physically active throughout the day. You know, because of my job, I have to use a lot of my computer. So what do I do? I work standing up. I have a stand-up desk. In that way, I'm able to move a little bit more. In fact, in your book that you got, Pandemic Busters, I have a whole chapter there on how they call uh, sitting down too much the new smoking, okay? because it's very, very inflammatory. Also, trans fatty acids, watch out. If when you read the ingredients, a lot of the baked uh, goods have this, if you see in those ingredients partially hydrogenated oil, run from it. <laughs> it's very inflammatory. Business people like to use this in baked goods like cookies and this type of things because that makes the product have a very long shelf life. So it's good for the person that is selling it, but it's not good for you. So watch out, read those ingredients. If you find that ingredient, avoid that product. It's not the best for you. Also, gingivitis. Inflammation of your gum, you know. If you're, you know, uh, having some of this, you have to go to a dentist. I don't like dentists, but you need them, you know. <laughs> they know what to do, you know, to help you with that. So don't wait. There's people, you know, for years and years, you can trigger all kinds of diseases because it triggers that chronic inflammation in your body. It's dangerous, so deal with it as soon as possible. And this is a fascinating study in which they did the following. They had two groups of people, and the 
uh, both groups were fasting overnight. And in the morning, one group continued fasting, just for comparison's sake, while the other one ate the following very inflammatory breakfast, which consisted of white bread, which is inflammatory, any refined food is inflammatory, egg, which is inflammatory, cheese, which is inflammatory, sausage, which is inflammatory, and then some hash browns. After eating that breakfast, notice on the top left, the bottom line, you can see no inflammation whatsoever. That's the people that continue fasting. But the people that ate that highly inflammatory breakfast, inflammation exploded in their body. Now, if you eat this stuff once every six months, it's not that big of a deal. You're going to have inflammation, and then after two, three days, inflammation is going to come down. But think about it. Inflammatory breakfast, inflammatory lunch, inflammatory supper. What, what are you doing? You're putting wood and wood and wood, and sooner or later, the flames are going to start creeping out, and you're going to get yourself in really big trouble. And see, this is not the way that our ancestors used to eat, the way that we're eating today. Our ancestors, most of our ancestors, were working in agriculture. And they would plant, and that's what they would eat. Of course, they had a goat there, or, or a calf there, but they couldn't eat that goat every day, because they only had one. <laughs> This was festivity food, you know. This was, you know, once, uh, you know, every two years or something when the daughter got married, you know, they would cook the goat and, and, and eat it. And the goat was over. You had to go back to what the ground was giving you. That was the food of our ancestors. Only a king or queen could kill their goat every day <laughs> because they had hundreds of them. You know, but the average person couldn't do that. But for some people, it's festivity every day. In fact, I remember when I was small, it was a cake on my birthday, but for some people, it's birthday every day, you know, <laughs> cake every day. And those excess are causing tremendous trouble because they are triggering inflammation, and we get ourselves in trouble secondary to that. Notice this uh, study from the journal Nutrients. I'm citing the study. The association, the link between animal product consumption and cancer was as strong as that linking tobacco and cancer. We know tobacco causes cancer. We know animal products cause cancer. And now you know why. The answer starts with an I. Why is that? <laughs> inflammation, because both of them trigger chronic inflammation in the body. And check this interesting study about cigarette smoking. In this study, what they were showing is that smoking one cigarette turns on inflammation in the body, and that inflammation lasts more than a day. Here's the question. Does the smoker smoke only one cigarette? <laughs> no, isn't it? Wood and wood and wood and wood, and you get yourself in really big trouble secondary to smoking. Now, some of you may be saying, well, doctor, I don't smoke. Congratulations that you don't smoke, but I hope you don't do this. This study was showing how eating two pounds of char-grilled meat is equivalent to smoking 600 cigarettes. <laughs> tremendously inflammatory. And this is published in the journal Science, one of the top journals in the world. Why is it so inflammatory? 
because meat is a very deficient food. Meat is just a bunch of protein, but there is no anti-inflammatory substances on it. So when you put that meat over the fire, the meat starts to change, the meat carcinogens are starting to be formed because there's nothing to stop that process from occurring. If you put a piece of potato there, the potato is loaded with antioxidants, it doesn't happen that to the potato. If you put a piece of eggplant there, it's no problem. The eggplant has anti-inflammatory substances that stop that inflammation. So this is a big headache for the public health people. See, in my microbiology book, when I was studying medicine, in that book it said the following, that a piece of chicken has more bacteria than your toilet. In fact, you put it in the microscope, there's all kinds of nasty germs in that piece of chicken. Now, if you don't cook enough this, you're going to end up exposing yourself to all kinds of germs. But if you cook it too much, it happens this. So where do you draw the line? It is very, very complicated. And Alzheimer's disease, this has been very well documented, the cause of Alzheimer's disease happened to be chronic inflammation. Anytime you create chronic inflammation in your body, you lose connections between brain cells. You keep doing that day in and day out, you're gonna get in trouble after a few years because of that destruction of those connections between brain cells. And notice this very, very interesting study. This study is from the American Heart Association. These are the leading risk factors for death in America. Let's correlate that with inflammation. So you can see there dietary risk, as we saw, you know, what you eat can trigger inflammation. Tobacco use, as we talked about, can trigger inflammation. High blood pressure, many times there is a chronic inflammation behind that. High body mass index, we talked about that, how that's inflammatory. High fasting plasma glucose, you know, prediabetes or diabetes, that's inflammatory. And then you have high total cholesterol, that's also inflammatory. Impaired kidney function, inflammation is part of that, that damage that happened on the kidney. Alcohol or drug use, we talked about that, that's inflammatory. Air pollution, that's inflammatory. And also, not doing enough exercise is inflammatory. When you go for a walk, you actually decrease inflammation in your body. That's what we did this morning as a family, you know. After breakfast, we went out. You know, it was nice and sunny and so forth. We had a good time there going for a nice anti-inflammatory walk. You know, that's a good family tradition, isn't it? <laughs> to do this, you know, as a family. So, in closing, is like a polar bear. Imagine that you go to the North Pole and you see these polar bears. And uh, you may be freezing, but the polar bear is having a grand time there. No, God designed the polar bear to live in that environment. What if you say, well, you know, poor bear, it's too cold there. I know of a desert, I'm going to bring that polar bear to the desert. You think the polar bear is going to be happy? <laughs> no, isn't it? The polar bear, you're going to kill the polar bear for putting them there because God didn't design the polar bear to be there. And that's what's happening with us. Many times our choices are like the polar bear in the desert. This photographer was analyzing what many Americans eat in one week, and he took this picture. Notice how every single thing that is there is inflammatory. The only healthy thing I find there 
are some grapes and some tomatoes. <laughs> Other than that, is highly inflammatory food. And this is devastating our families, our communities, as we cut short the life expectancy that we are supposed to have. Plus, in America, being sick is expensive, as you know. <laughs> Medications are not cheap, you know. And all these appointments and so forth, if we can avoid that, let's do it, isn't it? It is better for us, and especially because our spiritual sensitivities also get affected. And that's why Satan likes to introduce this chronic inflammation to destroy our lives. So instead of that inflammatory food, what we need to do, we need to run to the farmer's market. And we need to buy fruits from all kinds of colors, vegetables from all kinds of colors. Did you know that each shade on the colors have different properties? There's fruits and vegetables that are black, they're purple, some are uh, blue, some are red, some are orange, some are yellow, some are white. Each shade has different properties. So make sure that you rotate and try to find, you know, those different shades. Then you have the whole cereals and legumes. Legumes are loaded with good nutrition and they're cheap. I mean, how much it costs, you know, uh, 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 one uh, uh, pound of beans, you know, and how much food you make with that. You know, you make plenty of that. And then nuts, and then spices that are not spicy. That's the principle. <laughs> if they're spicy, what's happening to them? They cause irritation, and the irritation triggers what? <laughs> Inflammation. So watch out. Be wise on the spices that you're using. One of the best ones that you should be including on a regular basis is turmeric. Turmeric is one of the most anti-inflammatory spices around. You should be cooking a few days per week with turmeric because it's so anti-inflammatory. So there's a battle. There's a battle for your health between the substances that can trigger chronic inflammation versus something that are called the phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are chemicals that are only found on plants. Did you know there's more than 3,000 different phytochemicals in plants? I'm sure the people that sell you pills wish they could sell, you know, all those pills, 3,000 of them. Imagine that. But you don't need to buy those pills. You can go directly at their source by eating that food that is loaded with those antioxidants. It's like bringing a fire extinguisher to the fire. In that way, you stop that process and you stop inflammation. So to me, it's very interesting that in the very first chapter of the Bible, in the very first book of the Bible, the key is there. For God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be what? <laughs> Your anti-inflammatory food. <laughs> It's there. <laughs> it has been there from the beginning telling us, you know, what our choices should be because we can tackle that chronic inflammation and we can stop from devastating our lives. So may God bless you. Um, I think we have time for a few questions, isn't it? Um, so... Uh, le le let, me, le let me answer a, a few of your questions that you may have. That's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, to a certain degree, yes. Uh, for example, uh, black beans, they, they happen to be nice and, and, and high in iron, for example, you know. So, yes, you know, you, you don't want to eat the same one, you know, uh, as you rotate. And again, those legumes need to be the, the basis of your dishes, you know. Uh, you have lentils, you have chickpeas, you have beans with all kinds of different shades. You know, you go to other countries, you go to Bangladesh, one thing you notice, people eat a lot of legumes. Remember the cancer rates there in Bangladesh? Very nice and low. These are things we can learn from those, um, from those cultures and start to incorporate that in our own. In fact, sadly, many Americans are deficient in fiber. So when you start eating these foods, the gas and all these things start happening, you need to introduce them little by little. We need to cook them correctly. You know, you want to soak these legumes overnight, and then you cook them. Um, and with the, you know, these new devices, the, like the Ninja and these type of things, man, they can cook those things in 30 minutes, you know? Something that in the past, you know, would take you four or five hours. Something, if you want a, a good investment, uh, get yourself a crock pot. One of the best things you can have, you know. <laughs> you put their beans there with their spices and whatever, and then you leave that thing, you go for work, and by the time you come home, the food is warm and ready to be served. A crock pot costs you what, $15, $20, you know. Excellent investment to have, or you can even use it for breakfast foods. Uh, you can put your, you know, roll oats and whatever in the, as you go to bed. By the time you wake up, it's there. It's cooked, it's ready to be eaten. So, as you can see, you don't have to throw your food, your, you know, your, uh, your house through the window, you know, buying expensive food and so forth. In fact, it is healthier and cheaper, you know, if you go in this anti-inflammatory direction. I have a question about stress management. Yes. Especially you who. I had a question about stress management, especially you who went to medical school. Yes. I'm sure you were tempted with a lot of academic stress. Yes. And even for someone like me planning to go to college next year and other That's students right. and other stress, what would you recommend maybe some practical advice for handling stress? That's an excellent question. Uh, you can hear my whole story. Uh, go to audioverse.org and search there for a message by the name of a missionary on a secular campus. That's why I call my, <laughs> my testimony. And uh, basically, I kept my exercise program throughout medical school. I never went to bed later than 10 p.m. in the evening because I knew that our brains store the memories at night. So it doesn't make sense to study the whole night because I need to retain that information. And I think the strategy worked. The Lord blessed me and I graduated first place in my class. <laughs> so it's him the strategy work, you know. So it's better to go to bed early and wake up very early than stay studying the whole night. And exercise, you know, you, you have to keep exercise. Another thing, I made a commitment. I was going to start my day with worship every day. And it makes a big difference. Also, as you saw with the study regarding stress management and so forth. So, yeah, I'll give you that uh, audio verse uh, lecture there for homework. And, yeah, you can learn a few more hints from there. O oregano? Yeah, oregano is good. Oregano is a, is a, is a good anti-inflammatory spice. When we talk about sp spices that are spicy, we talk about more like pepper, you know? Black pepper, white pepper, not the best things for your system. Very, very irritating, you know? But it's not the only spice. Some people think that that's the only spice that exists. No, there's so many different spices that you can have access to. So yeah, watch out. Oregano, welcome. Very good uh, spice. What kind of vitamins do you take? 
Myself, only vitamin B12 and vitamin D. That's it. Other vitamins that you're taking, you are just making expensive urine. <laughs> it all <laughs> goes there and it goes out, you know. <laughs> so those people that are trying to sell you all these pills and so forth, look, it doesn't work, you know. It's just a money-making uh, scheme. If you go to my Twitter, you'll see I have many studies there talking about, you know, uh, how some of those vitamins are not the, 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 the best and, 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 and so forth. So, uh, in fact, uh, there's a reason why God put them together. What we do, we separate things. And, 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 and when you separate things and take them separately, it doesn't work as well as when God puts it together in the food. There's a reason why God put them in that format, you know. So, yeah, just your vitamin B12 and your vitamin D, and you're good. Here in, in, in Pennsylvania, we don't get enough sunlight to generate vitamin D. In fact, I used to live in Norway. If you came yesterday, you know, I was talking about that. And in Norway, they have an excellent public health guideline that says, if the month has the letter R, you need vitamin D. January, February, March, April, and then what's next? <laughs> May, no R. June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Okay? <laughs> so we live above the line where you can generate vitamin D in the winter months. Unless you want to go and spend your winters in Florida, which wouldn't be so bad of an idea. You, know? <laughs> you got plenty of vitamin D down there in the winter, you know, but not here. So make sure that you take that vitamin D. In fact, if you have been living here in Pennsylvania for a while, I would even suggest that next time you go to the doctor, you ask your doctor, doctor, can you please test my vitamin D levels? Because you need to see if what you are doing is working. Some people have very low vitamin D levels, and they don't realize it. And that increases risk for many problems, uh, from severity of COVID-19 to increase of certain cancer risk and so forth. So watch out, you know, watch that vitamin D, make sure it's, it's, it's nice and on level. <laughs> is that they're recording, D, so. What? Vitamin D and vitamin B12, B as in boy, B12. So B12, if you're going to switch to a whole food plant-based diet, what we're talking about, then it's important for you to take some vitamin B12. I've been following that diet for 30 years, okay? And uh, as I check my, my, my vitamin B12, it's nice and high. Once or twice uh, a week, 500 to 1,000 micrograms of vitamin B12, more than enough. Okay? You, don't, you don't need that much. Okay? You can buy it at Walmart. $5 costs a little thing. You know? So it's not like, oh, super expensive uh, supplement. No, you know, it's very, very cheap, the vitamin B12. Um, is the B12 that you take, is that synthetic or is it uh, food-based? That's right. Yeah. So. The issue is that, it, that vitamin B12 comes from bacteria. All mammals um, need vitamin B12. Now, have you seen the cow eating the supplement of vitamin B12? <laughs> Where does the cow get his vitamin B12? Well, when the cow is eating that grass, it pulls dirt and there is vitamin B12 in the dirt. Now, I don't encourage you to eat your vitamin B12 from the dirt, okay? <laughs> or you wash your veggies. Okay? So if you wash your veggies, you're going to wash out all that vitamin B12. There's a small group of people that their colon and their small intestine, there's a little door there, sphincter is called, and that sphincter doesn't work very good. And there's a little bit of communication between your big intestine and your small intestine. And some vitamin B12 is forming the colon. So they get vitamin B12 that way. 
But that's just a small group of people. If you're not taking enough vitamin B12, you can get yourself in really big trouble because your nervous system is dependent on B12. So if you're going to be switching to that whole food plant-based diet, it's a good idea to be taking some B12. Even today, many foods have B12. A lot of the oat milk and soy milk and so forth, they have, many of them have uh, vitamin B12. Uh, some of the analogs have vitamin B12. Uh, some of the cold cereals you buy in the store have B12. So in America, we have nice uh, you know, amount of B12 around in many of the foods that we eat. But just to play it safe, you know, it doesn't hurt to take, you know, one or two of those pills there per week. Okay. So. Um, we do a lot of shopping at the grocery store. Good. The grocery store has all those non-organic vegetables. Yes. Can you say a few words about the difference between organic and non-organic and what it may or may not be doing to us? Good. Good question. That's a very good question. I'm somebody that doesn't encourage you to go all organic. I mean, it would be great if you could do it, but practically for most people, it doesn't work. So in my book, I'm going to give you homework. There is a section there in which I am listing you what are called the dirty dozen. The dirty dozen are the foods with the highest amounts of pesticides in them. So those foods is a good idea, you know, to really, really wash them well or to try to decrease them or to try to find an organic source. Other than that, if you are washing your foods correctly, uh, you're able to decrease quite a bit that insect, uh, uh, pesticide uh, load, okay? Even the spirit of prophecy says that you should spray your apples. Okay? So the spirit of prophecy says this. Okay? So yeah, just make sure that you are washing your foods correctly. There's an excellent website called nutritionfacts.org. I'm happy to be co-authoring a book of nutrition with the author of that website, Michael Greger. And Michael Greger does a fantastic job at checking current important topics and summarizing that in a video for the lay person of three to five minutes explaining the summary of that. So check out pesticide there. That's, that has some very good uh, uh, videos there about you know, how to wash the vegetables and so forth. So yeah, you can decrease a lot of that pesticide loads. Uh, um, my worry is uh, the Bible tells us to eat the fruits that have seeds, mm -hmm. but our markets now are flooded with seedless fruits, yes. and we seem to be feasting on it, disobeying what God wants us to do. So yes, where do we go from there? That's a good question, and that was actually, um, that Bible verse is pre-flood. Okay. So then, um, after that, uh, then uh, grasses are introduced, grains and, 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 and tubers, uh, roots and so forth are introduced to the diet of the human. If you study a little bit, you know the transition of the, of the diets. So basically the reason why you find all those seedless uh, fruits and so forth is because consumers don't like to deal with those seeds. <laughs> they complain, you know. <laughs> I, you know, I, I travel, as I, you heard, I've been to 88 countries, and there's places that you open the orange, man, you know, it's, uh, uh, there's five seats per each, you know, thing of orange, you know. So, to me, it's not that big of a deal, you know. This is more uh, because the consumer are asking for these things, so they have made things in a way that, you know, the seats are no longer very present in them, and also because many of these commercial people don't want you to take that seed and plant the same thing, you know. So, yeah, there's some issues there. So, I wouldn't be very much worried about that. I would worry more about avoiding inflammatory food. See, these seedless uh, fruits, 
don't, they are not inflammatory. You know, that, that will be my really big concern. You know, are they inflammatory? So rather avoid, you know, things that are inflammatory. And uh, yeah, you know, you have food choices. Uh, even here in Allentown, you have a nice farmer's market. You know, if you want something, you know, more f directly from the plant, well, you know, you have that, that option. Okay. I'm under the impression that fruits without seeds are bioengineered mm -hmm. and are toxic, mm -hmm. but I'm not a practicing biologist, yes. so let me know. Okay, that's a very, very interesting and complex question. You know, what about those bioengineered foods? Personally, I don't like that they're modifying these things. You know, that's my personal, <laughs> you know, if you ask me, you know. But this is the world that we live in. Now, this is very interesting to me. If we were to divide, we have this wall here. We're going to put here studies that show that animal products can cause problems. Man, it's loaded with studies. I have them. You know, I have, I have gigabytes of information regarding that. Now, if we go to this wall where we have GMO info, it's very um, nebulous. It's not as clear as this one, you know. Now, some people are focusing too much on this wall, but neglecting this one, you know. <laughs> so make sure that you are dealing with the inflammatory foods first and foremost, because we know for sure this is very inflammatory. Regarding GMOs, sometimes the problem may not necessarily be the GMO, but many times happen to be the pesticide that accompanies that. See, they customize these foods so that certain pesticide can be used on that. We've seen, you know, in our, in our program, when I was in California, patients would come, many times they would think that they have an allergy against wheat, but the problem was not the wheat in some of them, you know, some of them it was the wheat, you know, but some of them, the issue was more the pesticides that comes with the wheat. They would switch to organic and it would go away the problem, which tells us, you know, it was that gliophosphate, you know, that they use that Roundup uh, stuff, you know. So, yeah, that's something that we need to, you know, um, have more understanding. Again, the, the, the studies are, are very nebulous, you know. It's not as, as clear cut, you know, that said, oh, you know, this is for sure this and this and this. Again, I don't like that they do that. Personally, I try to avoid that as much as possible, but I'm not fanatic, you know, that, oh, if it has, you know, definitely never, ever, and, and, and so forth, I go to a potluck or whatever, you know. So, yeah, you know, you personally need to decide, you know, where you're going to put your line, you know, and, 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 and go from there. Long COVID cough that people seem to have. Good question. Whether it produces phlegm or not, it's still a cough. Yeah. Okay. Um, long COVID can affect different organs, but regarding the one specifically to the lungs, what we want to do, we want to do some exercise there so we can start to increase lung capacity. We want to do some steam inhalations. So you put your water to, to boil and then you put a towel above your head and you breathe that steam, you know. That steam uh, happens to, you know, uh, cleanse up your respiratory tract. You will see it works really, really well. And you want to challenge your lungs through exercise and also blowing um, these things, um, balloons, you know. As you do that exercise, you, you start to improve your, your lung capacity. And finally, we still don't understand 100% what's causing that lung COVID, but one of the theories, I have put a few studies of that in my Twitter, is that the coronavirus stays for too long in the body. So what we want to do, we want to do things that improve our immunity 
in that way the body can take control and start to get rid of those remnants of that coronavirus and that may potentially improve the outcome of this. So again, you know, the whole book's 22 things that you need to be putting into, into practice. So start implementing those things. All those things have a positive effect. And if you have access to a sauna bath, I would be going to a sauna bath, uh, you know, once a, once a week. Uh, that increase of heat, uh, there's a lot of, there's plenty of research there how it improves your immunity. You may be able to decrease, you know, that bothersome cough and so forth. Yeah, um, I mentioned that briefly, just very, very uh, little in the, in the, in the, in the, in the book. Um, it could potentially help a little bit, but it's not uh, uh, just take this and that's it, you know. You take that, but then what about the other factors? You know, are you doing exercise? Are you going to bed? Are you avoiding you know, sugar? Are you dealing with your emotions in a healthy way? So, so, so it's the whole package, you know, that you need to be taking into, into, into place. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, ginger, a little bit to give a flavor, that's okay. But ginger, if you put too much, starts to become, you know, uh, spicy and, and, and so forth. And uh, pimiento, what do you mean by the pimiento? You mean the red pepper? You mean by the... Okay. Okay, okay. That's right, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the leaf, the the, the bark, that that will be fine, you know. So the the the, the pepper itself uh, will be a little bit more careful with that, you know. Mm -hmm. Are frozen fruits and vegetables okay rather than the fresh? That's a very good question, and the answer is yes. They're excellent, the frozen fruits, because. Uh, they, they pick them up ripe, and when you freeze all those vitamins and so forth, they retain actually really good in the freezer. Just don't keep them too long. You know, if you keep them, you know, more than six months and so forth, then they start losing some of that uh, nutrition. So, yes, it's an excellent choice to do. In fact, uh, that's something that some families do. You know, when, when the foods are in season, you buy a bunch of that, you cut it down, put it, you know, in, in, in bags, and you put it in your freezer, and then you can be eating them, you know, throughout in the winter months and, and so forth. So, yes, that's an excellent way. Nutritionfacts.org, the one I told you about, uh, look for the studies there. There's some very interesting studies there showing you, you know, how the, the quality of nutrition is retained through that process. Dr. Esselton from Cleveland Clinic has yes. mentioned get rid of oils. That's right. Is that a yeah, good idea? Good question. Yeah, Dr. Esselstyn, I'm also co-author with him in a nutrition book, uh, uh, Dr. Esselstyn. So, yes, in his program, he removes uh, oils and nuts also from, from, from his program. So, in my opinion, um, this is the issue. See, we take too much oil today. If you read in the Bible, you know, they use a lot of olive oil and so forth, but they would do a lot of exercise, you know. I mean, in order to survive back then, you had to be working in the fields there. You had to walk a lot. You had to carry all this weight and so forth. And today we don't do those things, you know. Life is easy now. So we are more likely to be eating, you know, excess uh, calories and, and so forth. So if somebody is uh, trying to reverse diabetes, if so somebody's trying to reverse hypertension, if somebody's trying to lose weight, somebody's trying to reverse atherosclerosis, like the program of Dr. Esselstyn, 
I would be, you know, trying to eliminate oils as much as possible, okay? If you are healthy and are very active, a little bit of oil could be beneficial as you need more calories. In fact, your skin can tell you. If your skin starts to become too dry, it means you need to increase a little bit the amount of oils in your diet. And regarding nuts, you know, nuts are excellent foods. We should be eating nuts every day. Loma Linda University has done plenty of studies about that. But eat the nuts in its natural state, not the ones that are fried, not the ones that are salted. All those ones, you know, you get in trouble, you know, for eating those type of nuts. So, yeah, eat the nuts the way that God made them. Okay. Very good. No, raw roasted is no problem. The problem is when they add all these things, you know. You want to give some word on veggie meat? Yeah. <laughs> okay, veggie meat. <laughs> so veggie meat, I find it useful when you're doing the transition. Um, if you're like a you know, big meat eater and you're going to switch to a full plant-based diet, it's like a bridge. When you're crossing the bridge, you, know, you, you may partake some of that, but you don't stay in the bridge, isn't it? <laughs> you need to keep on walking, okay? And you need to go back to real food. Once in a while, it's not that big of a deal, you know. But uh, some people, you know, every week and so forth, that's too much, you know. That is, that is too much. It's, it's refined food. You know, that, that's the problem with, with, with refined food. We get ourselves in trouble when we eat refined food. So we want to eat real food. That should be our objective. So, yeah, watch out for that. Very good. Okie dokie. Um, yesterday morning you spoke of um, the Pennsylvania Conference or potentially in this area a lifestyle That's right. center. Is that on paper or is that actually being planned out? It would be nice to have something in the area. Yeah, it would be fantastic. To me it's so interesting that here in the East we don't have a lifestyle center. I mean, they're down in the south, you know, Georgia, Alabama. They're in the Midwest up in South Dakota. They are in the Pacific there in, you know, Weimar and, and, and so forth. But nothing here. And we have the highest density population in America here. You know, we have Philadelphia, Baltimore, D.C., New York, all the cities up, Newark and so forth in New Jersey, uh, Pittsburgh and no lifestyle center. So uh, where are we with this? Uh, we need to raise funds to make this a reality. So we're actually in the process of creating a website and we can show you know, a little bit of what this will be consisted of and, 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 and so forth. So yeah, that's where we're at. You know? uh, without the funding, you, know, you, you cannot uh, do this. And we want to have a model that is uh, affordable, you know, that, that most people can actually participate of this, because that's, that's the goal, you know. I mean, I know some programs, for example, Joel Furman, mm -hmm. uh, he has a lifestyle center in San Diego. It'll cost you a good $20,000 to go to that program. I mean, you decrease very much who can participate of this type of program, you know. So we want to have it, you know, as, as open as possible so as many people as possible can participate of this program. So that's where we're at. Um, what do you think of dairy? Um, what about raw dairy? And um, do you think that's a good food? Dairy, yeah. 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 Yeah, dairy, unfortunately, is inflammatory. Dairy has saturated fat which also contributes to atherosclerosis, increasing your risk for heart disease and stroke. And it's very interesting. Um, many ethnicities don't handle dairy very well. You know, there are all kinds of stomach problems, allergies, and so forth. I did a study um, in India, and you know, Indian people drink a lot of dairy there, use a lot of dairy. 
Yet we found that more than 50% of the Indians, genetically speaking, have severe um, intolerance towards dairy. You know? So yeah, that's the challenge with that. And especially, it's interesting, when people come to the Lifestyle Center, you know, that I work for in this place for close to 30 years, and we take away different things in their, in their food items and so forth, the thing that they miss the most happened to be cheese. <laughs> if you ask them, you know, from all the things that, that, that we took away, what, what is the thing that you really miss the most? Cheese. And the reason being is that cheese stimulates the opioid receptors. The same receptors that are stimulated, you know, by uh, cocaine and all these things. Now, it's not the same intensity, but still, they stimulate those. So, in the same way as things that give pleasure, when you stop them, um, you know, you need to go through a process, uh, the same story happens with dairy. You know, when you stop it in dairy, your body is going to ask for it. You know, just like a smoker, you stop smoking, the body will ask for that smoke. But you have to re-educate your taste buds and, 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 and so forth. And another issue is yeah, uh, the, um, uh, uh, what is called oxidized cholesterol. Oxidized cholesterol is fine in, found in dairy, and uh, that is something that is uh, quite toxic on the body. So, yeah, you know, that's some of the reasons why these things, you know, may not be the, the, the best things today. I have a whole lecture on um, diseases and germs and animals and so forth. I, I don't have time, you know, to tell you all the things, but also you're exposing yourself to different germs and things through dairy and so forth. In raw milk, do you get the problem of the exposure of the tox of the germs? You know, it's better regarding uh, oxidized cholesterol. They have less oxidized cholesterol, but you have more exposure to, to germs, and that's the challenge with with, with raw dairy. Now, I, I'm against that they're penalizing this, you know, and even the you know the. Uh, uh, USDA will come and, 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 and raid your farm and so forth. I think people that want to do this should be free to do so. But <laughs> beware of the dangers of partaking of this. You know, that, that, that's something that you need to take into account as you take your personal choices. The, all that is fine, you know. In fact, my daughters grew up without drinking any dairy. They don't even know what it tastes like, okay? And they have grown, and that's their choice today. You know, I mean, that's the way they, they grew up, and they're happy. So, you know, to me, you know, you need to classify foods as red light, yellow light, and green light. So do your, your scoring system, you know, where you want to put your yellow, where you want to put your red. Yellow, you know, once in a while type of food. And red, you know, that's where you draw your, your line. So, yeah, you know, set up foods like that. And in that way, you know, start making your choices. Now, you cannot be running on yellow constantly or you're going to get a ticket. <laughs> so, so this should be a once in a while type of thing, you know. So, yeah, classify things in those three colors. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you so much for your attention. And, um, yeah, I don't know if any of you want to. Yes. Yeah, you can share the video. Yes, 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 that's what it's there for, you know, so, yes. <laughs> Very good. Like a lot of the plant-based milks, I've noticed yes. had like inflammatory oils in them, like added in like different gums That's right. in them that they sell at grocery stores. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I don't know, it's just kind of an issue. With yeah. Well, what makes an oil inflammatory is the following. So you have omega-6 and then you have omega-3. There's many more, but let's just summarize in those two. So there needs to be a ratio of more omega-3 and less omega-6. 
when you're eating oils that have it backward, you are eating too much omega-6 and too little omega-3, that's when you get in trouble. Now, in uh, milks, usually the amount of oil actually happens to be very small. So if you want to play it safe, what you want to do when you eat your cereal or your oatmeal, add some flax seed, that's omega-3, add some chia seeds, that's omega-3, add some nuts, that's omega-3, and you contrast any potential flip, you know, type of uh, ratio that could have been inflammatory, you stop that by increasing those omega-3. So that's, that's what you do, and you don't have to worry. Good question. Excellent. Okay. Well, I don't know if any of you want to close or... or uh, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, for coming tonight. So let's, uh, let's have a, a prayer. And um, uh, thank you for, for coming. And, and yeah, looking forward to working more with you guys. You know, I, I, we have decided, you know, that, that you guys are going to be, you know, one of our main things. We're going to be supporting this, uh, you know, first six months of the year. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you know, we'll be doing some other programs uh, together. So let's close with a, with a prayer. Our Father, we are grateful for the way that you created the human being. And uh, Lord, we just ask for wisdom as we try to make the best choices. And Lord, there may be things uh, that we may need to make some changes. And we just ask, Lord, that uh, you may guide us through your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to have that health so that we can continue to serve others and serve you. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings and continue to guide us throughout this week. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. <laughs>